Okay, thank you very much uh, for inviting me along to give this talk. It's always challenging to use the new technology, but let's see how we go. So um, this work is associated with, uh, let's see if I can get this to go, yep. And that one should go too. So this work is uh, associated with um, really trying to build spatial awareness for um, uh, embedded systems. So we're, we're really thinking about um, the new generation of simultaneous localization and mapping. And the idea is that we really want um, this to be a ubiquitous technology, something that can be on your phone. There's a lot of phones already have systems that are, are capable of this sort of thing with various, various different tricks that they're using. But um, on your vacuum cleaner, on your lawnmower, in your car, in all sorts of applications. Particularly at the moment, I'm working with the RG pilot community and we're trying to get it onto, um, onto um, aerial drones. And this particular example is um, a visual odometry system that we're working on with my, my student, um, Peter Van Gore here. And you can see the actual algorithm operating on the top right hand side uh, where points are identified and uh, as the filter operates, the correct depth of the point is, is extracted from the data and then uh, a, um, a trace, which is the actual trajectory, the red trace of the uh, camera is um, plotted based on the acquired structure of the scene that, that, uh, that's, that's visible. So the idea is to be able to do that, but to do it um, in an efficient and effective way. So to start with, I thought I'd, I'd just give a little bit of perspective and uh, talk about three concepts which actually are um, psychological concepts of human perception. So one of them is this concept of spatial perception. And this is the ability to perceive spatial relationships in respect to the pose of one's body. So take this Escher diagram, and if you imagine looking down at that Escher diagram, you've got the, uh, the footprints in the, in the dirt that you can see. Behind the footprints is the pool of water. Behind the pool of water is a tree, and behind the tree is the sun. And so spatial perception is this ability to sort of look at objects in the world and see them in respect to your pose. Now, of course, when we look at that, we say, well, there's a reflection involved in this. And actually the tree is in a parallel plane to where I'm standing and the sun is actually above me and off to the side of the, of the tree. And that ability to extract structure from an environment is actually a different ability and that's called spatial awareness. So spatial awareness is the ability to understand the spatial relationships that apply to the objects around one and, and put those in a frame of reference separate from oneself. So in this picture of um, Escher, you know, we can see things in front of us, but clearly our mind is capable of spatial awareness and we can build a 3D scene in our mind and we can actually understand where Escher is, where the chair is, where other objects are. And so a key difference between spatial perception and spatial awareness is this ability to abstract the frame of reference or abstract the um, perspective that you understand the world in. And so that's a key capability that we want to be able to provide uh, robots with. And spatial ability is something that, that actually I don't talk about, but that's the capacity to understand and reason about spatial relationships among objects or space around one. So obviously, a robot's going to have trouble with this scene, but uh, the um, spatial ability is that ability, once you actually have a perception of the world, to actually think about distances to, it's the ability that humans use when instead of walking around the block to get to somewhere which you knew was on the other side of the block, you might take a shorter route because you have a perception of the block as a square and so you know what the, what the short route that you want to take is. So what this talk is about is at the bottom here, it's about developing algorithms to develop spatial awareness for consumer electronics, such as toys, watches, vacuum cleaners, stereos, things like that. So in particular, we're looking for algorithms that are super robust, that are low, uh, low computational cost, and that just work. We're not looking necessarily for an algorithm that's got the best root mean square error uh, based on hours worth of computation. We're actually looking for the sort of algorithms that you can put on real robots. So um, let me just sort of introduce the problem a little bit. And so because I'm working a lot on uh, UAVs, I've, I've sort of picked a UAV example. So um, what, we're, what we're interested is um, having a robot equipped with a sensor uh, 
moving through the world. So this this um, robot will be will be moving, and it's perceiving. So its perception system is to perceive a set of points or potentially directions in the environment. So this direction Y7 might be a horizon direction. Okay, so it's it's at an infinite depth, infinite distance, but it's a it's a very well defined direction. Uh, this uh, point here would be at a finite depth. It'd be the base of a tree or something similar. You may well have a gravity vector um, or something similar to that that you're able to able to acquire. And so all of this information is uh, available to the robot in the robot's body fixed frame. Okay, somewhere separate to this, there'll be some reference frame, which is where we would like then to be able to express the information. So we um, introduce a state to understand uh, our environment by. And so that state is going to consist of points at the moment. And I, I'll deal with them. Um, actually, in this talk, I won't deal with directions. I'll just deal with points. But we can model directions in an, equal, an equally effective manner. And so they're just simply going to be uh, three dimensional vectors. And I'll use the homogeneous coordinates uh, where appropriate. And then the pose of my actual robot is a rotation matrix and a position. So a displacement with respect to the inertial frame of reference and a rotation with respect to the inertial frame of reference. And so you see, whereas the perception problem, you don't need this information about the state. And the perception problem is well defined without the inertial frame. We introduce the inertial frame in the state representation. So it's really this perception or this, this um, coordinatization of the environment in terms of an arbitrary frame of reference that makes spatial, spatial awareness as compared to just a, a sensor operating on a robot. All right, so the um, state space that we're going to end up with is this object here, which I'll call T of N. And so it consists of uh, one robot pose and a collection of uh, environment points, okay? And so it looks like an SE3 cross R3 cross multiple copies of R3. So um, the sort of environment measurements that we're going to be taking are going to be body fixed frame measurements. So this is the YI here of a point PI that's sitting in, in space. And so the uh, homogeneous coordinates of the uh, pose matrix give us a formula for computing the uh, measurement of a landmark in the body fix frame from the, uh, from the robot pose. Okay, so in this talk, I'll talk about 3D measurements of this nature. Um, we also can deal with bearing measurements with different, uh, different symmetries. And if I have time, I'll get on to uh, some um, visual odometry uh, type problems that, we, that we've actually got some modeling for. All right, so the other part of the talk is equivariance. So we're taking an equivariant perspective on spatial awareness. So what actually is equivariance? So an equivariant system is an ordinary differential equation of this form here, uh, where the state psi lies on a smooth manifold and the input V lies in some vector space. And in particular, I'm going to be interested in modeling kinematic systems where the relationship between the inputs and the, the function F are linear. So F is a linear function of the, of the um, inputs V. So it's equivariant if there exists a Lie group, so some sort of symmetry group that acts on it, and if there exists a transitive group action that acts on the space, along with the group action that acts on the inputs such that you get this, this um, symmetry relationship at the bottom here. So I'll show you a, a picture of how to uh, understand the symmetry in a moment. Um, let's, let's start by thinking about what is actually a symmetry and then I'll come back and I'll look at this, this equation and explain to you what it's really telling you about things. All right, so this, this group action here is really the essence of a mathematical representation of a symmetry. So what, what actually is a symmetry? So if we think of a space, and in this case, I'm thinking of the sphere. So I've drawn an apple, but let's imagine that it's a sphere. So a symmetry is 
a rotation. In this case, you can rotate that sphere in any direction and you get back the same object. And so a group action is a mathematical expression of that symmetry. So for every rotation that you imagine applying to that object, the mapping defined at the bottom here that takes a point psi to the rotated point psi is a mapping that takes the whole of the sphere to the whole of the sphere and returns a sphere. So that's a symmetry mapping. And the family of all such symmetry mappings, so for this group, here is a family of symmetry mappings. The family of all such symmetry mappings then is the object that we're going to struct, we're going to study, and that is what's known as a group action. So a group action can be thought of as a uh, a coordinatization or a collection of symmetries of a space. So this is the figure that goes along with that equation that I was showing you. So if we look at the equation back here, um, what I was saying is I have a system F and somehow I apply something to do with the group action. So some sort of symmetry operator and I get back something that looks like the function again. So the way to understand that is as follows. So if we imagine picking a point psi zero, and evaluating the function. So that's that blue line of evaluating the function. So that's at a single point in space. So say I'm, I'm sitting at one point and I know what my function is there. I'm interested in what my function is at this point over here in space, okay? Now there's one way of computing it is to just compute the value of it at that point in space. So phi of x psi is the group action that takes psi zero or a group action that takes psi zero to x. This value here is really just, just the value x, right? I allow myself to transform the input in some way. And then I simply evaluate the f at that particular point. And what equivariance tells you is that that is the same as taking the differential of this mapping here, which maps from psi to psi, to psi zero to x, taking the differential of that mapping and uh, applying it to the F zero object. So what it means is that if you know your symmetries and if you know your function at one point, those two pieces of information together tell you your, your function at every point, okay? So it really captures this concept of an invariance of a system dynamics, right? So that if I know what gravity is at this point in space, I can go anywhere else in the world. And because gravity is symmetric around a rotation around the, uh, the origin of the earth, I, I get back exactly the same system of equations, right? And so that's a very powerful model uh, property that we want to be able to exploit, okay? And so equivariance is a wonderful thing. So um, does spatial awareness have this symmetry. So is spatial awareness, the standard spatial awareness system, is it equivariant? And in order to answer that question, what we need to do is say, is there a symmetry of the state space of equivariance? So just remembering what the state space of equivariance was, right? We had a, uh, we had a, a, a reference frame zero that I'm defining things with respect to. I have a set of points, P1 to Pn, and I have a pose of a robot. So I'm interested in finding a group and a group action which acts on this space Tn to give back that same space in some well-defined manner. And so let's think about it in terms of a group action. So what do we need to do to spatial awareness coordinates in order to do something sensible? So let's start with the the robot pose. So here's the robot pose. Okay. And I want to be able to move to any other robot pose. Okay. And I can do that by applying essentially a, uh, a rigid body transformation, which is a dotted blue line to my robot. So it basically moves P to PA in the coordinates of, of zero. Okay. So that's an obvious thing to do. Uh, to create a symmetry of robot pose. And so that process is encoded into the first coordinate of my symmetry action. So I act on the right by uh, a um, rigid body transformation. So I change coordinates and, uh, and apply that to my robot pose. Uh, 
All right, now in terms of the points, I have these R3 points. So this here is one of my, one of my environment points. What I want to do with that point is I want to transform it to a new point P prime. Okay, that's, that's the goal. And so it's, it's an object in R3 space. So all I'm going to do is add a delta to it. Okay, so that's the concept that's going on here. I have the point and I add some object to that point to transform it in R3 space. And the trick is how to actually define that, uh, that transformation. And the answer is that you need to think about um, the fact that these are going to be concatenated group actions. You can't just add any object there. You've got to think about adding a delta A in the frame of reference, not in the frame of reference of the robot here, it's in the frame of reference of the origin of A. So little A's and big A's go together. They're all in the group. And because I'm applying it here to P, then it's as though it's sitting at the origin of P. So I have to derotate by the P vector and then I can add it to the P prime. And that's exactly what this notation is giving me here. So the A with a zero over the top of it is just the A1, A2, A3, and a zero underneath it. So in homogeneous coordinates, you just get a, a rotation matrix applying to it. Now, interestingly, that operation, which at the moment, this operation here is just an algebraic operation that I've told you. Um, it clearly is well-defined. It clearly takes uh, points, robot poses P to robot poses PA, and it takes environment points to a new point P prime. So it clearly acts on the, uh, on the space that I want it to. And it's fairly easy to see that it is uh, transitive so that it can take any P to any PA by the correct choice of A and any little p to any other p prime because I get complete arbitrary choice of the little ai's. So the question is, is it actually a group action? And the answer is, well, you need to define what you mean by the group. And so there's this group um, here, which is uh, I call the SLAM group. Uh, and I introduced that in a paper a couple of years ago in the CDC in Melbourne. Um, but it was also, it was first uh, coined by Bonneville um, in a 2015 paper that I hadn't, hadn't been aware of at the time. Um, and so the idea of this group here is it looks very, very similar, right? So it has the, an SE3 object and it has a bunch of R3 type objects. But we actually think about these R3 objects as part of the, uh, the real uh, vector space group. So essentially, um, vector addition on the, uh, on the vector space. So they're not actually vectors, they're just uh, picking up the, the vector addition property of that group with uh, zero as the, as the identity. And then we define a group operation. So this is a multiplication between elements of the group. And you can see that it's not quite the same as, uh, as a, um, a rigid body transformation, right? So this part here is concatenation of rigid body transformations. This part is not quite the same because it's, um, it's uh, the RA matrix is the rotation of A, but the little a is actually the translation associated with that vector, not the, uh, not the translation that would be associated with the, the uh, SE3 object. So it's not just um, SE3 operations, right? Each one of these little a's is different. Okay, these RAs are all the same, but each little a i is different. And so the actual um, group, the matrix representation is a little bit different. There is a matrix representation for this group, but the algebraic representation is more direct. So this is actually a novel Lie group, as far as I can tell. So uh, Bonnebel was the first to introduce it back in 2015, but as far as I know, it's not been studied uh, by mathematicians as a classical, classical group. And so that's why I think it's it's something that's quite interesting uh, in, in the uh, community at the moment. So it has uh, an identity operator, okay, as you'd expect, and it has an inverse operation, which is not, not that surprising as well. So this is a group. Um, and with that group operation, I didn't actually include a slide on it, but that group operation does make this uh, operation here a group action. And so this symmetry is indeed parameterized by, by this group. 
So we have the first part of what we want, right? So we have a group um, and we have a group action, right? And the question that we ask is, is uh, the system that we're looking at, the SLAM system, is it an equivariant system? Okay. So the SLAM kinematics are these kinematics here, right? So the robot is moving with uh, normal velocity. So the, um, the U wedge that I'm writing here would be uh, a rigid body angular velocity and a linear velocity in the body fixed frame. So it would have uh, that sort of structure to it. And this is just rigid body kinematics of a, of a robot, right? So, and we're assuming that we measure angular and linear velocity of the robot. And we make the stationary, uh, stationary world assumption. So we assume that the points in the world aren't moving at all. All right, so then the question is, does, the, does this system satisfy the equivariance requirement that we want? So if you remember, we took the group action, we applied the differential of the group action for an element A to the function. So in this case, this is p dot, p dot, little p i dot that I'm putting in here. So little p i dot zero. So I take the differential of this object here and I substitute in and you can see basically I'm going to replace p by p dot. So that's what I've done here. I, whoops, not p a, but by p dot. Okay, so P gets replaced. So uh, where am I going? I've got talking about this the wrong way. I'll start again. So I'm differentiating this object. So I take that expression, I replace P by P dot, and I keep the A. Okay, in this expression here, I re replace P bar by P bar dot, which is zero. So that disappears. P by P dot, which is this term here, and I keep the A. All right, and I do that for the entire expression. And this middle line here, all I've done is I've substituted in a, a minus one in order that I can bracket the adjoint operator here. And then I've bracketed these terms separately as well. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm identifying a bit here, which is going to be a P prime. So this is going to be P, the old robot pose, gets transformed to a new robot pose, P prime my velocity gets transformed. So u gets transformed to a u prime via an adjoint operation on the velocity space. And so that's not that surprising, right? We, we know that in, in symmetry groups, the adjoint operator is exactly the correct operator to change the base of reference of a velocity measurement. And so this, this sort of a transformation is not, not surprising at all. But this transformation here is a little bit surprising, right? Because if you look at my, my old kinematics, I had that the, uh, the environment is stationary, whereas here, my environment is not stationary. So the question is, does this mean that I'm not looking at a, a, uh, an equivariant system or what's actually missing? And what's actually missing is really quite interesting. So the answer is that you can't model the original SLAM system as an equivariant system, but you can model a slightly extended system. So if I consider an extended system where I add additional velocities in here to the uh, point measurement. So I allow the points in the world to move. But when I simulate this system, so when I actually apply my observer, I'm going to uh, measure, you know, measure is a prior knowledge perhaps in this case, I'm going to set the VIs to zero. So there's nothing at all stopping me using this model. This is an extended model, which contains the particular SLAM kinematics that I'm interested in, and has the property now that it has these non-zero velocities in a place where my equivariance operator is telling me I need to go looking for velocities. Okay, so based on that, then we can go in and we can define a, an operator, uh, a group action on the velocity space. So my new velocity space here is the old robot velocity, plus these new velocities here that are applied to each, each of the individual points. And so my group action that I'm going to define picks up the adjoint change of coordinates, which we saw in the previous, and then it's got this term here. And I won't go through all of the derivations of the, the group action, but I'll show you some analogies. 
So if VI1 is zero, if you imagine that zero, what we're looking at is an A to the minus one, V um, A to the minus one. And if you look back here, you'll see that that's exactly what we're getting. We're getting an A to the minus one. We've got a U where V is equal to U prime, U which, sorry, and you get your AN there at the end. So you can see that this um, group action that we're defining here is actually capturing that concept of velocity. In this case, it's capturing it, or in the previous case, it was capturing it exactly when V is equal to zero. And this action is capturing it for the general system when V is not necessarily equal to zero. Of course, the benefit of doing this modeling is that now if you have a uh, moving point in the environment, uh, you, have the model, you have the model for that already. Okay. Uh, so um, we can uh, go back and look at the equation. This is the equation that we derived on the previous page. And we get uh, P prime and a V prime, and we get a V zero prime uh, where the P prime is coming from the P prime action. The P prime action also generates these terms, but none of those actually turn up in the, uh, in the expression. So we don't have to worry about those. The V action, the Psi action, it is important. It turns up here and it turns up in all of the V zeros. So with this geometry, we now get, uh, we now get this uh, equivariance that we were looking for. So yes, the uh, SLAM problem is equivariant, um, or more correctly to say, the SLAM problem is intrinsically embedded in an equivariant problem, in an equivariant system. And so it's that extended system that we're going to use as the model for our, uh, for our observer system. All right, so that, um, that gets us uh, through um, a little bit of the top level geometry. And then we say, okay, well now I've got uh, some understanding of equivariance for this particular system. How can I go about actually using that to do an observer design? And so the key, the key idea here is the ability to use the symmetry group to parameterize, to coordinatize is the right word to say, the, uh, the manifold that we're interested in. So let's go back to my, my apple example. So we think about this apple, say, as a, as a sphere. And we know that we can apply symmetries to that sphere that transform the apple into an apple but change points. So change this psi point, psi zero point, to a point psi, okay? So that's the structure that we've looked at so far. And equivariance is all about understanding how that maps into, into kinematics of an actual system. But the fact that we have a group action means we can also look at it in this other way. So we can fix the psi zero, and then we can imagine mapping to a point psi uh, from the rotation matrix R. So what we're doing here is instead of mapping from M to M, we're mapping from SO3 to M. So in this case, we locked an element R and looked at the mapping from M to M. In this case, we lock an element Psi zero and we look at the mapping from G to M. And so that mapping there is well-defined. It's an onto mapping because of the transitivity of the original assumptions that we made about our group action. And it can be used to provide a parameterization. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually pose our observer state on the Lie group, right? And we're going to use this mapping that we've just, just defined to actually generate the observer output. So to actually generate the estimate of the state we have this natural symmetry operator that, that tells us how to, how to generate that estimate. So a key part of this is the choice of what I call an origin. So in order to do this, we need to choose an origin. And of course, by changing the origin, you change the way that the Lie group parameterizes the space. And it happens in a symmetric way and you can study that. But in general, the way to think about it is that we fix an origin uh, we pose our observer on the Lie group, and then we can generate an estimate by applying the, the group action. So when you do this, right, remember that we have uh, kinematics on this system, right? So my actual system kinematics look like 
look like this. So they're an actual system that sits at a point and the trajectory of the system passes along those ordinary differential equations. What I want to do now is I want to pose a system on the Lie group, right? So I want to be up here with some kinematics up on the Lie group and in particular so that these kinematics map down onto the, uh, onto the state space, onto the true system kinematics. And this is going to be critical because being able to define these kinematics is what we need in, in order to define the internal model for my observer. So one of the theorems that we've been working on uh, for the last uh, few years, so this was originally presented in a null cost paper in 2013, uh, is this theorem here. And it basically says that if you take any state space, so I'm taking any space M, with a group that acts on it, and I require that the group acts transitively. So I require that the group group acts on the whole of the uh, space M in order to make this result. And that's the only assumption that's made. Then uh, if I have a system that is operational on the underlying space, um, then there exists a, a map here. So this is a, um, a map the lambda that I, I define here is a map from the space M across the inputs into the Lie algebra of the group. That's the actual structure. So this is an algebra element of the group. Uh, this element here, of course, is an element of the manifold. And this is an input, of course. And this system, which is a in the form of a left invariant system, this system then will project down under the, under the projection d5 psi zero onto the system. So basically trajectories map. So this object that I've just defined up here, and I'm not going to go through the, the details of the definition. I, I can put people onto the, onto the papers. This object here is going to become an internal model for the, uh, for the, um, for the observer, right? So I'm going to put my observer state up here, I'm going to have an internal model that's a, a pre-image of the system kinematics, and then I'm going to solve the problem in that way. So in the uh, SLAM problem, how does this actualize in the SLAM problem? So the first thing that you have to do is choose a, a reference origin. And so this is an additional degree of freedom from classical SLAM algorithms. Classical SLAM algorithms, they don't have any reference origin that, that gets chosen in the algorithm. They just parameterize the coordinates directly. So in our case, we don't parameterize the coordinates, we parameterize the transformation that takes an origin to our estimate. Okay, that's the way to think about it. Now, having said that, of course, an obvious choice here would be uh, the identity matrix and some zeros, which is essentially mapping uh, our algorithm as close as possible to a classical algorithm in terms of the meaning of the variables but it's, it's not necessarily a particularly good way to think when you're trying to understand what's going on. It's the best way to think when you're doing comparisons between the variables. So our state estimate then is the group action applied to the origin. So it's the, tra it's the, the actual observer state is going to be an element of the group and the output state is this, this transformed version of that. And we get a set of lifted kinematics that, um, come from the group and they're very, they're very, very simple in the case of SLAM, right? You get a part here, which is really just a pre-image of the P dot U. So there's a, that's really the pre-image of this PU um, wedge type kinematics and that's it, right? So the pre-image of the uh, P, P dot I kinematics, of course, is zero. So you don't get anything here. And this term and this term are my innovations. So at the moment, I just leave them as general elements uh, that I'm going to define in uh, my actual um, observer design process. And that's a very typical sort of structure that you get. So something that actually algebraically is very, very simple. So the, uh, the observer architecture in block diagram is going to look something like this. So you have a system that's sitting there and it's got the P.0 uh, kinematics to it. My observer lives on the group and it's going to have a set of kinematics which are associated with the lifted system and uh, these two innovation terms, this delta and this delta. And both of those innovation terms are allowed to depend on the measurements and on the state of the observer. 
My output, my state estimate then has the uh, symmetry operation applied to it. So applied to the group action. So that's how you generate the output. And I'm going to add this additional step here of defining an error. And this is going to be the criteria that I use to design my observer. So I'm going to now talk a little bit about how do you define errors in order to define an observer? Because at the end of the day, what we want is that P hat, P hat converges to the true state P and P. Okay. But that's not necessarily the best way of defining an error. And so there's this intrinsic concept of error that I want to talk a little bit about. So the way that we can define an error. So what you have to remember is um, that the observer state lives up on the Lie group. It's, it's not down here, right? So the error that we want isn't between Xi hat and Xi. The error we want is actually between the observer state and, and Xi. And of course I could postulate an observer error, which is the following error, which would be the Xi zero X hat. Right. And I take that in some space that uh, the, the addition um, subtraction sign is not actually defined on a general manifold, but if we linearize it, we can do something like that. And so the question is, well, why, why not use an error like that? And the answer is it's not intrinsic to the problem. Whereas this concept of error is an intrinsic concept of error. And you can see it's actually quite simple what the error is. It says, take your element Psi, right? And imagine that my group X hat has the correct transformation to take Psi zero to Psi hat. So imagine that's correct. Well, what I can do is I can apply the reverse transformation Psi hat to the minus one to Psi and in these error coordinates, what I should get is something that looks like Psi, Psi zero, right? So the error that I generate uh, should be um, close to Psi zero. So when um, my error is equal to Psi zero, then my, um, my X hat will be the correct X hat to generate the required output, if that makes sense. So this construction is one that uh, seems very, very simple, but it's, it's actually really quite profound how, how powerful it is. And in fact, we can prove that whereas this is an invariant error, there is no invariant error that exists between the two manifolds. So you cannot structure, you cannot build an object here that has the properties that we get at that level there. So I thought it was worth taking five minutes just to do the example for the slam problem. And so I've written down the two errors here. So this is what uh, you would do if you were just doing slam, right? So you have a pose P, you have uh, points PI that you're interested in. And so I want to, I want to have my pose P hat go close to my pose, my true, my true plant. And so P hat, P P hat to the minus one should go to the identity matrix and P minus P hat goes to zero. So this is the error that everyone would write down as a first guess of uh, a slam, a slam error, right? So the error that we write down is different, right? It's this, this object here, right? So we apply, sorry, this is a phi here. So E equals, so we apply the inverse of the state estimate to the true pose and we get something that looks like this. I won't, I won't work it out in, in real time but you get something like that looks like this. And what you want is that this looks like P zero and that this looks like P I zero. Okay. And if I chose P zero to be equal to the identity, then that would be similar to what we talked about before. And if I chose P I zeros to be equal to the identity, that would be similar to what we talked about bef uh, above. Right. But what you can see very clearly is that P I is not equal to P hat. Not obviously anyway. So let's just have a little bit more of a look at that. So the way to, to really get a handle on what goes wrong here is to understand uh, one of the problems in SLAM. And I, I normally spend a bit of time in a talk talking about this, but I've only got one slide on it today. And that's the, the, the fact that SLAM problems have a property called invariance, a gauge invariance. And so, the, it comes from the fact that the slam problem is 
only in relative data. So if I have my robot pose here, my robot's moving through space in some way, um, it measures environment points here. And, you know, right through this talk, I've said, well, we, what we want is we want to be able to write down um, an arbitrary um, inertial frame of reference or a reference frame, right? But this, <coughs> this reference frame is not intrinsic to the problem, right? I could equally well have written down a reference frame over here with the two reference frames related by some rigid body transformation. And the coordinates of the intrinsic, the, the, the relative coordinates of the SLAM problem are completely independent of that choice, right? The actual coordinates of my solution change, right? So uh, my PI that I represented here changes and my, uh, my pose of the robot changes but the actual motion of the robot and the relative measurements don't. And so what it does is it defines this uh, conjugacy relationship. So it basically says that in a SLAM problem, if I have a state PPI, there is no physical difference. It's, it's entirely equivalent to another state, which is obtained by pre-multiplying by any orthogonal, uh, not orthogonal, um, rigid body transformation. So this is sort of fundamental symmetry that's in the SLAM. And in particular, one of the things that you can do is if you imagine, um, this is meant to be a minus one. If you imagine uh, this uh, coordinates of the, the point, I can choose S to be P minus one, and I can write uh, any robot pose in what we call egocentric coordinates. And so what, what these coordinates are is representing the environment in the body fixed frame of the robot. That's really all that this is doing. It's really writing these, writing the, the, the coordinates in the body fixed frame of the robot and the pose, of course, in the body fixed frame is the identity element. So what we've done here is it's almost like a set of local coordinates. This is, well, it's, a, it's an R3 to R3 parameterization, right? Because the, uh, the SE3 part is always the identity. Now let's study these errors in that representation. So let's study the classical SLAM error here and pre-multiply all of its elements by the inverse of the PP hat minus one. So when you do that, you, you multiply through this P to the minus one watt, P gives you back the measurement <coughs> and you get an expression that, that's written on the right hand side there. Okay, so the key part of the error is going to be this. This is what's going to actually make the algorithm work, making that small. Now, in contrast, when we do the equivariant slam error, we get this much more complicated expression on the left. When I pre-multiply it by a hat p minus one, which I've done here, and multiply it through, I still get p to the minus one p, so I'm still gonna get my y, but this term on the right-hand side here is actually, uh, it's act, whoops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. It's actually, uh, you can see it, it's, it's, um, this is the XP part, this is the RP part. So that's actually homogeneous coordinates. So that's the same thing as P acting, uh, P inverse acting on the homogeneous coordinates and takes, takes away this effect and that effect and gives you back just, just this term here. So at the end of the day, once you've done this comparison in local coordinates, we're comparing this expression for the error to this expression of the error. And what you can see as a really important part of it is the top expression depends on the pose of the robot, not on just the measurements and the state. So this bottom expression here actually depends only on known variables. So in fact, this error in local coordinates is, is realizable. So we can understand exactly what's going on. So that's a property that comes from the invariance of the, uh, of the error with respect to this group action. And this, the fact that the P is sitting in here rather than a P hat, which is sort of what's, what's going on in, in this one down here, uh, is really the essence of the difference between doing this problem properly with the geometry and doing it simply by hand in, in the coordinates that are available. Now the, the SLAM problem is one of the most subtle to understand that, that difference in. Um, most of the other problems we've studied, it actually, it's, it's very hard to actually even write down such an error. Whereas this, this error here 
we actually have the formula. Once you have the group action, you can always write down this error. This error here depends on, uh, it depends on being able to just write down some formula like that, which you, you get to choose, right? It's uh, some local coordinates that you, you impose on the problem. So not only is this a better error, even in this case, but it's an intrinsic error. And so it's much, much better, much more general. All right, so hopefully I've convinced you that doing this is a good idea. Um, at least theoretically, we haven't seen any results yet, um, but I will show you some results in a little bit. I'm not going to go through uh, deriving uh, observers uh, at the moment, though um, we've got a couple of exciting papers coming out at the moment, and there's the uh, CDC paper that I'm happy to refer people to. Um, but the observer that we derived, we did through just a simple uh, control Lyapunov uh, type approach, and so it was very much a constructive nonlinear design for the observer. And we ended up with a value uh, for the innovation delta uh, of this form here and the little delta i's uh, this form here. So you can see that uh, what we're doing in the, um, uh, in the output is we've generated this epsilon object, which I've written at the top, which is, is based on the same sort of construction as uh, the um, as the group error that we were doing, but it's just in the output. And what we're doing is we're driving that output to the reference y zero. So that's that's exactly what you'd expect uh, from a, a gradient descent algorithm. And then here we're we're um, minimising a, a cost function that um, is comes out of a Frobenius norm um, minimisation. All right, and so that generates an observer, which, which looks something like this. So what we did, just to show you some results on this, is we did a simulation of um, a 2D slam problem. So uh, what we see here is a trajectory of a robot. So we have a robot that's moving in a square, and the robot actually is moving in an exact square. It's not, it's not moving around at all. So it's actually moving in the exact square. And as it moves, it uh, gets noisy uh, velocity measurements and it gets noisy measurements of lots of environment points. And in the environment here, you can see the little black crosses are the um, estimate of the state and the little green pluses are the estimates, sorry, the black crosses are the true state. So that's actually the point PI and the little green pluses are the P hat I. And this is one time around and the second time around. So first time around the trajectory and second time around the trajectory. That's the sort of um, structure that you've got there. Um, over on the right hand side, um, you're getting actually, again, you can see the same sort of structure here. All right, depending on which time around the trajectory we're plotting. So the, um, the right hand side then is a, a standard EKF slam filter and it's got all of the properties of that. It gets loop closure. So when the robot arrives at this point here and sees once again points that it saw right at the start, it's able to correct the whole pose of the robot. Uh, so it's able to actually recorrect the entire pose of the robot. But what we have added is um, we've added, uh, I think it's 3% or 5% um, data association errors. So instead of uh, seeing this point and thinking that it's that point, we're swapping this point with this point in terms of what goes into the algorithm. So this is a very common error that occurs in uh, in any embedded system that you, you're tracking points and if there's lots of points close together, you confuse uh, a couple of points and then you, you swap the track around. So what you can see is that by adding that uh, that in, the EKF is is actually getting fed um, noise, which is non-Gaussian effectively. And when you feed an EKF something that's non-Gaussian, even quite a small amount of something that's non-Gaussian, we're only adding in about three to five percent in here, you start to destroy the performance of the filter. And so this is uh, a nice little graph that sort of indicates that um, for everyone. So this is a uh, root mean square error of the, um, of the map um, following the trajectory uh, of the trajectory, I think, following the um, the uh, uh, so it's a, a Monte Carlo simulation. So I think there's um, I think there's 500 simulations at each noise level and then average. 
And so what you can see is that, uh, and at the bottom here, what we've got is the probability of uh, mislabeling. So data association error, right? So that's the, uh, the issue that we're getting at the bottom here. And so when there's no data association error, the Kalman filter assumptions are perfect, right? There's still Gaussian noise in the measurement. There's still Gaussian noise in the velocity, but those assumptions are correct. And what we can see is that the, uh, this is the equivariant filter performance here, and this is the Kalman filter performance here. What we can see is that the Kalman filter has a lower mean uh, performance and less variance in the performance, right? So for one in 100 uh, data points mislabeled, uh, we see a degradation in the Kalman filter performance, a slight degradation in the EQF performance as well. For two in 100, perhaps you might choose the Kalman filter, but by the time you get up to three in 100, so three in 100 or one in 30 roughly data association errors, uh, you're starting to see the advantages of working in these global coordinates and working with a global error, uh, which is not subject to the same optimization assumptions around the, the Gaussian, the Gaussian, um, the Gaussian variables. And so that's what we're, that's what we're sort of going for here, right? Remember I'm talking about embedded systems and uh, dynamic systems. So, so we really want something that's super robust to the, um, to these sort of errors, which are the sort of errors that chew up a lot of processing times in image processing systems and such like. And of course, because we're not uh, computing a covariance matrix, so we're not carrying around a, an N squared uh, matrix inversion, our memory and our uh, processing time are uh, way, way less. And so again, really, really good for embedded systems. Um, so Iman, I will just ask you a question. Would you like me to stop there or can I have five minutes for a couple of extra slides? Um, yeah, five minutes is good because we still have 10 minutes to go, so it's good. Okay, so I'll, I'll be as quick as I can, but a couple of minutes, okay. So um, we had a look there at the SLAM problem, right? And so, as I said, that SLAM symmetry was around back in 2015, Silver uh, was publishing it. I published it in 2017 parallel, and I think there's a few other people around the world who were looking at it in a similar time. Interestingly enough, that same problem uh, has multiple symmetries. So that's that Lie group that I showed you is only one of three Lie groups that I know of that act on that particular state space. And um, this is one of the things that I'm finding really interesting in this subject is that actually by choosing different symmetries, you can get different properties of algorithms. And I believe, and it's still a belief at the moment, we're, we're still working on some results that we can really show some very exciting results. So what I want to do is really super quickly uh, run you through two different um, uh, symmetries. And uh, the first one is really a leader to the second one. So the first one's what I call uh, an egocentric um, Euclidean symmetry. And so um, we still have the robot pose here. We still have an environment point. So we're dealing with exactly the same um, variables as what we were dealing with before. We transform the robot pose in the same way, right? So this transformation of the robot pose is exactly the same. Rigid body transformation A, and we get a new robot pose PA. So nothing's changed there. The way we transform the environment point to a new point PI prime is different though. What we do is we take the point PI and we rewrite it in the body fixed frame, okay, as an R bar. So we first, the first step here, we transform P to something in the body fixed frame. So that's the rigid body transformation into the body fixed frame. In the rigid body frame, we add a displacement, a little a vector, okay? That's your little a vector that we were talking about. So that's going to be part of the group. And then we read that as though it's in the body fixed coordinates of the PA group, right? So what we do is we take what we just had, which is this, this object here, which we thought of in coordinates P, and we now think of it in coordinates PA. And so we take that bit and we rewrite it back into the zero coordinates, but we, we invert out of PA coordinates. So it's as though we've transformed into the body fix frame, applied the A at the same time as we apply the big A. So this little A and this big A are happening at the same time. And then we, we come out at the other end. Now, hopefully it's pretty, pretty clear that that's going to get you a new point. Uh, it's definitely a, uh, 
a, a, a map, it's well defined, it's transitive, and you'll have to take my word for it, but it is indeed a group, a group action. And in fact, it, it is a group action of the same, of, the, of a group, which is this group here, R3, um, R, but with the direct product. So the previous group that we had, I had to define a certain multiplication for it. This symmetry has the direct product group acting on it. All right, so I don't want to spend more time on that. I want to show you this one, which is really exciting. So this, again, we start with the same points, P's and P's, right? So there's no difference in what we're doing uh, in terms of variables. The, um, the robot symmetry is exactly the same, right? I haven't changed the robot symmetry at all, but I have changed the PI symmetry. So the PI, the first thing I do is I do what I did in the previous one. I write it in egocentric coordinates, okay? So that, that step there is exactly the same. The second step is different, right? So instead of adding an AI vector, right, which is what I did last time, instead of that, I transform it by rotating it and scaling it. Okay, so um, this QA now is an SO3. This QA is an SO3 element. And this little a now is an element of the multiplicative reals of one dimension. So basically, it's a, it's a positive real, uh, real number. Okay, so that certainly gets me to a different point somewhere in space. And then I do what I did in the previous one. I unwind with respect to the new PA coordinates. Now, the cool thing about this symmetry is it respects bearings, right? So it rotates and scales things. It doesn't add things. And rotation and scaling is something that respects um, vision. So visual measurements aren't... 3D points. So visual measurements are directions. And so the sort of data that you're going to need to work with if you want to do visual odometry are these sort of data here where you take the 3D point and then you take away its scale, right? So in this case, we're, we're modeling it on, on the sphere. So it's basically a unit vector in the direction of the point that's observed. And the key thing is that that VSLAM symmetry that I was talking about, right, which had SE3 for the group, and then each point gets rotated and scaled, it um, goes along with a, an action on the output space as well, right? So you get this beautiful sort of equivariance in both the system kinematics and the action. The cost is that our symmetry group is now an SO3 cross R3. So this symmetry group, each one of these is four dimensional, right? Whereas before our symmetry group was three dimensional, we have to go up to four dimensional because the symmetry of the sphere is SO3, is three dimensional. And, uh, and so there's stabilizers in our, in our group. Now with that symmetry, we get back these, um, this cool uh, video that we showed you at, at first. So this is actually the explanation of what we're doing here. So the observer that uh, Peter has coded in here is using the VSLAM symmetry. So it's basically computing every single point here by a rotation. So it's, it's measuring rotations and rescaling. So you can see the rescaling as the points sort of zip in and out along the, uh, along the distances. Does that work again? Should be able to run it again. Aha. Uh, my technology has worked really well until now, so I, I, won't, uh, I won't try and run it again. Um, anyway, so that's, that's actually the underlying mathematics that makes all of that work. Ah, there we go. It runs again when I press the button. Um, so there's a summary slide, which I think I'm going to skip over because I'm a little bit short of time and it's a bit boring. And I'll just say thanks to Jochen and Tarek. And of course, Peter, who's done all the simulations and is working in this area at the moment. And that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob, for a very interesting talk. We have two minutes. If anyone has, has a question, just raise your hand or message me. Do I see anyone? No? Nice. Good. I just have a quick question myself. I mean, the la you, you, you mentioned robustness, and it seems the last uh, a group action that you found, because it's only multiplication, you don't have this adding up of the errors due to vector summations? 
when you implement it, have you thought about the impact of not having it? It's, I don't know. I have, it might be the most robust implementation. You might get the most robust implementation in the end. Does it make sense or not? Um, it's a good question. Uh, so the question is that when you add multiple errors, mm -hmm. how do you, I mean, it, it's a little bit, I mean, I think it's a really good question. It's making me think, think a bit deeply, right? But mm -hmm. um, I think if I paraphrase your question, it would be, how does stochastic noise add together when we're going through this concatenation of rotations and scalings? Yes, yes. That's sort of what you're getting at? Yes. Yeah. So um, it works better. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that, that's, um, that was a feeling as well, but I, I didn't know if, if there is a good, I mean, if there is anything more. <laughs> Yeah, more concrete. Yeah, but that, I agree. That... I'm actually telling you why it works better. Yeah. Um, it's to do with the fact that the way the noise enters is uh, so at least in asymptotic performance. So you basically you need to think about this in terms of tra transient and asymptotic performance. In asymptotic performance, the linearization of our algorithm is at a single point in error space, right? So our error coordinates converge to a constant point. We linearize at that point and the way the noise interacts is in that single space, which is not moving or transforming. If you do the EKF, effectively you're linearizing around the trajectory and as that trajectory moves, it moves around, yeah. you, you're actually adding curvature to the, the way the covariance propagates, okay? Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't help you with transients, but understanding transients in uh, stochastic filtering is too hard for me. So yeah, okay, I'll leave no. that to Girish. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Uh, we will have one more question. Emilian, do you want to ask your question yourself? Just unmute and ask. Hi, yes, so I've got a question because I've read papers on invariant and filtering, which is I think linked because you, you will do an extending time and filter on on the Lee group, and it was applied by Bonabel, I think so. Yes. On, on, on this pose estimation problem, and I wonder if, if there is a link between your approach and, and his. Yes, there is a very, very close link. So uh, Silver's group, uh, so Silver and Bat Axel and co are doing fabulous work, um, really, really, really cool stuff. And uh, Silver and I have been developing in parallel very, very, very similar theories. So what I showed you today didn't have a stochastic aspect to it. So Silver's work, the EK, IEKF, he uses similar um, error coordinates and then does a stochastic filter on those. Um, but it's still, his work is still based on this conceptual idea of the extended Kalman filter. So it's still based around propagation of errors through left translation. And the work I'm doing is based on global error parameterization. So I'm, I'm very much coming from the point of view of you write down these global errors. And if you want to do a stochastic filter, if you want to do a, um, a uh, time, time gain varying filter, then you'll linearize the error coordinates. Now, in a lot of systems of interest, they're actually going to end up being the same filter. And so the IEKF and my filter or the, what, there's a filter that I'm working on at the moment called the EQF, so the equivariant filter, which is based around linearization of the error coordinates. And they, they match up for group affine systems, if you know that, that language. But they don't match up, match up for all systems. And so this, I, in this particular example, I went through a process where I talked about velocity extension of the system. And that velocity extension process is actually a much more general process. And there's a whole class of systems that you can velocity extend where the IEKF uh, doesn't apply the way Silver's done it. Now, having said that, I mean, Silver is still doing research. He might well, in the last year or two, have been doing exactly the same stuff. We have, we've been doing parallel work for, for years now, so, yeah. Thank you. Good. Iman, you're uh, muted if you're talking. Good that you pointed out because I was talking to myself again. 
thanks again for uh, thanks everyone for your attention and thanks Rob a lot for the great talk that he gave and see you next Friday for another talk. Thank you. Thanks very much for the invitation. Cheers. Thanks. Ciao. Uh, Rob, just